Mm -hmm. Arnold Senow, known as the Get Along Coach, works with leaders and teams to help them get along better with colleagues, coworkers, and customers by improving communication, emotional intelligence, interpersonal relationships, and presentation skills. He holds the CSP designation, Certified Speaking Professional, and I can tell you it's very hard to get, by the National Speakers Association. Arnold has delivered tw over 2,500 keynotes and training programs worldwide to organizations such as the Marin County Realtors Association, Anthem Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Southern California, British Telecom, the FBI, Lexus and Toyota, law firms, and the Association of Professional Nanny Agencies. Arnold is the author or co-author of seven books, including Get Along With Anyone, Anytime, Anywhere, and Present With Power, Punch, and Pizzazz. He's a former adjunct professor at Georgetown University and frequent guest in the media. Successful Meetings Magazine recently rated Arnold as one of the top five best bang for the buck speakers in the USA, and his peers ranked him as one of the top 30 global gurus in communication. Today, Arnold will share tips and tools to get along better with anyone, anytime, anywhere. Plus, if you email Arnold, he will send you <clears throat> a free copy of his book. Can you believe that? A free copy of his book of the same name and add you to his free two-minute easing tip list with tools and solutions to get along better to build rapport, relationships, and connect with customers, coworkers, family, and friends. I'd like to welcome Arnold Sano. Okay. Thank you, Janice. Um, first of all, first of all, thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody getting up early for this today. There's an old saying, it's a never too late to learn, but sometimes it's too early for some of you guys. And uh, for those of you who are sort of just getting up, this is your 18th Zoom of the day. Oh, not the day, you're just getting up, but your Zoom, you're going through everything, you're tired, you're grumpy. And for those of you who are sort of in that category, I always like to start off with this prayer for you guys who feel a little tired and grumpy on that. And it went like this, it says, dear God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped and I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been nasty, grumpy, or selfish. I'm in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed and that's going to need a lot of help. Amen. So hopefully you're wide awake um, and ready to go um, because in the short time I have with you, you know, really want to, as Janice was saying, I want to share some tips, tools, and solutions uh, on how to get along better with anyone, anytime, anywhere. So today be positive, but test negative. So we'll get on the right track there. Um, so let me start off by asking you some questions. And by the way, I have you all in gallery view because I just want to, you know, maybe ask some questions if you have a comment or you want to add something, because this is really about you to get some information, not just about me. But by show of hands, uh, has anyone here ever uh, known or worked with someone who was difficult or just never got along? Just by show of hands, anybody ever worked with just one of you? No, I'm, I'm sorry, some of you see. Okay, well, let me ask you another question. Is anyone here uh, difficult or sometimes doesn't get along, sometimes difficult. Okay, now just two of you, it's amazing. I had like a million before, but two of you now. Okay, uh, let me ask you this. How many of you realize too that the interactions you have with others can cause or tra trigger others to be difficult? Sort of like a snippy remark or uh, body language or words or tones or how you say something, something like that too. And so what I wanna do is start off that, I, just, I wanna start off with this when we talk about getting along, the people are not necessarily difficult, but they are, and this is the interactive part. Anybody want to click your button and tell me what they are? They're not difficult. They are different from us. Different. Okay. Patricia got it. Yeah. Patricia's, Patricia's been around NSA. So she, you probably know all the answers to these, but by now, so anyway, but, but people are different. And when I say different, um, you know, we all have separate world views. We were raised differently. We had different experiences, uh, backgrounds. We come from different aspects. It's sort of like in the last election. I don't know if anybody had families where yet one was on one side and one was the other. Anybody have something like that? You know, they're and they got together and it's like everybody's saying, well, how can you see it that way? And how can you see it that way? And, you know, it's like, well, it's because we're all different. And and the point is, is when we don't see things the way other people see it, we think people we think they're difficult. So or we think they don't get along. 
So as I said, we're going to explore some ways to improve your personal and professional relationships to get along better. And I said, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, war stories, disagreements, this is your time. I'm not here to waste it. So feel free to bring it up. So let me talk about getting along, first of all. And um, a lot of you have probably read Emotional Intelligence. And Daniel Goldman, who wrote the book, said, we are judged by a new yardstick, not only just how smart we are by our training or expertise, but also how we handle ourselves and each other. And even in this high tech world where we're doing stuff like this, high touch is still an important thing. And if you look at it, you know, if you look at the studies, what's the number one key quality to life uh, of living longer, of getting along and stuff like that? It's really the connections and relationships that you have. So it is important. And by the way, just to get into this a little bit of why is it so important to get along? Has anyone here ever watched that so, uh, show, So You Think You Can Dance? Anybody ever watch that show there? Uh, anybody been in it before? No, anyway. Uh, well, there's a there's a, a a judge on there called Nigel Litho, Lithgow, right? Lithgow, I think. And he says it's not necessarily best dancers who win; it's the ones they like the most. When you really boil it down to it. And by the way, I, uh, as I go through this, I know a lot of people get all their information from the Harvard Business Review and studies. And I just watch these TV shows and give you some information. So anyway, but he has some good comments there. So everything being equal, people deal with what? They deal with people they like and they trust. We all know that. But on the other flip side of that, everything being unequal, they still deal with people they like and they trust. So for example, has anybody, uh, all of us have gone out to maybe buy a car in the past and you go to the dealers. How many of you ever gone to the dealers and the car looked great? Uh, it had the right price. Uh, everything about the car was perfect except there was just something you didn't like about the salesperson. Everybody know what I'm talking about? There was just something. And so, you know, everything being equal, you know, but everything unequal, I, so I maybe go to another dealer. How many of you ever hired, you thought about hiring somebody, they sounded great, they did this, but there's just something I didn't like about them. So we've got to take a look at that. And it's interesting in working with companies and organizations over the last 30, uh, 30 years, I find that 90% of the communication breakdowns, the challenges of why people don't get along, really go into four categories. It goes into misunderstanding, misinformation, miscommunication, or mistrust. And it, it's a lot of it's inadvertent too. So for example, if Patricia's my boss and I walk down the hall in the morning and I say, good morning, Patricia. And she says nothing. Okay, as her employee, you know, um, she might just having, you know, having a day, she's not thinking about it, but as an employee, what am I thinking? I'm thinking, oh man, she hates me. It's a slight, am I going to lose my job? All these things start, we start making assumptions about things. So you got to be very careful, you know, when we talk about paying attention to people in those areas. I'll give you one more example too, of how these breakdowns happen. Um, one of my clients is uh, Chrysler in Auburn Hills, Michigan. And I go up every quarter and I do some work with some of the dealers that come in and, and these dealers are usually professional football players and baseball players. And we went out to dinner one time and they're all getting all excited. They're yelling and they're screaming and they're all this stuff. And, you know, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I don't think we're rude. Um, they don't think they're rude, but, you know, I noticed when I was looking around that all these people, you know, people weren't sitting near us. They always, you know, when they come in, they'd say, we don't want to sit near them. And, and so the, the thing is, it's a lot of this stuff is inadvertent and people think of you in certain ways. And it's interesting, according to Harvard and Stanford University, there was a study a while ago that said only 15% of your success and this is related to work-wise and your job in, in, is building cooperation, getting things done, creating a positive environment will be due to your technical skills and 85% will depend on your communication, your emotional intelligence, your people skills, and really your ability to get along when you really deal with it. And we'll be talking about getting along just to give you that, that 15% and that 85%. Um, I don't know if anybody heard of this. I, I live in the Washington DC area and, and uh, is interesting, a number of years ago, there was this Coast Guard captain that committed suicide. I don't know if anybody read about that, but he was technically brilliant. He knew the rules, the regulations. He was got A's on his reports. But one day he went to a staff meeting and he said a few off color words. He offended half the people there. And you know, he got, he, he, they filed grievances and obviously he took it to the a general area. Or I don't know if you remember the woman in the Senate office building, she kept saying, hey, thanks, hon, thanks, babe, thanks, hon, thanks, babe. Some guy said, I'm offended you're calling me babe. And she, and I don't wanna get political about this, but she lost her job because of that. So, and of course, remember when we talk about stereotypes too, uh, in that 15 and 85% area. Anybody remember Susan Boyle, the woman in Britain's Got Talent? Anybody ever saw that, Britain's Got Talent? And she was like, she comes out on the stage and 
I think it was Simon Cowell was giving her like, oh God, who does she think she is? And it's just because she didn't look like what? She didn't look like the speaker, not the speaker, but the singer that you're supposed to look like. Uh, and then she blew him out of the water. Um, and, and it's interesting too, because when we talk about um, stereotypes, has anybody ever, just by show of hands, I did this a few weeks ago. Has anybody ever gone into a Target and wore a red polo shirt? Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? Nobody's gone into Target and, and Target, the department store. And everybody there, and, and so I went in with a, a red polo shirt and about five people literally asked me, do you know where this is? Do you know where this is? You, it's, it's like, they just perceive you as working there. And after about the fourth person, I just started taking the where it was. And people said, man, this guy is such great customer service. And it was, you know, I don't even work there, but anyway, moving on, uh, it, it just sort of uh, gets into some of those, just those areas. So the key is perception. We've all heard the term perception is reality, which is not really true, but my perception is your reality. Um, I know Patricia will talk a lot about this too, but, but even how you come across in a, in a meeting, it could be virtual or your dress or your, or your aspect of it or your smile or, or everything. And what's the old saying? It's like in, uh, people make up their minds about you in milliseconds. And then you got to talk your way out of it no matter what's happening. So just be aware of some of this stuff. And we'll talk more about that later as you go on. But I do like to say that uh, no matter how well people get along, uh, even in slight improvement in your communication and your everyday interactions and your emotional intelligence and understanding others will definitely make an impact. And that's what we'll talk about today there. So let's just get into some specific things you can actually do. And the first one I said before was that a lot of this has an effect on your body language, your tone, your voice. So I wanna give you a little acronym to help you be more approachable, likable and trustworthy so that people have the right impression about you. And the acronym is S-O-F-T-E-N. So if you wanna, it's soften, S-O-F-T-E-N. So uh, let me ask you a question. So the S is, and since body language is such a big part of how we come across, whether it's in person or virtual, what does the S mean? Anybody wanna take a guess? Body language being a big part of how we come across. The S is, anybody, you can, un, you can unmute and tell me what the S is. Smile. Smile, okay, Patricia's got it. Boy, you're getting A's all day today. So, um, <laughs> so smile. And by the way, when we say smile, let me just say a few things. If you do not normally smile, don't start doing it all of a sudden. Uh, and what I mean by that is people that will know you are wondering, what's she, what's she up to? What are they doing? You know, they, they just get nervous about that too. Um, and also when we talk about a smile, um, you know, actually you know, a smile actually makes you feel better too. I, I was one of these seminars, I forget the speaker who did this, but he all had us, Patricia might know, or Janice may know, he had us do this with when we start off. We all had to come in the room and push our, you might want to, don't do that now. But anyway, we made us do all this stuff with our fingers and it actually forces you and you start actually feeling better because of that aspect of it too. Uh, a couple of things I will also say smile to. Uh, if you have bad news, um, smile only when appropriate. You know, I saw a, a newscaster on TV one time and it was interesting because he got up and he, um, and this was years ago, but he said there were five deaths in Fallujah and he had this weird smile on his face. And that doesn't mean he's happy about it, but there's a, you know how we're nervous sometimes, a nervous reaction and he smiled, but you know, five deaths and he's smiling, it sort of gives the wrong impression uh, in that way. So to talk about some of those things uh, in those areas too. And by the way, one of the companies I was working with before, um, we had like 60% less complaints with the call center operators because we did one thing. And anybody want to take a guess what that is to make sure people smiled? Put a mirror in front of them. Yeah, who said that? Oh. Funny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that was Tony. Yeah. Uh, they put a mirror and I don't know if you've done that Tony or not, um, but we put a mirror next to every operator's desk at that organization. And yes, guess what? When they got on the phone, they had to do this. And we go ring, 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 ring. Good morning. How are they had to look in the mirror before they spoke. And so they saw the smile and everybody said, Oh, they're so nice. And they're so pleasant and all that stuff. Now, I don't know if I changed the culture at all, but at least people thought they were nice. So uh, that made, that made the difference in that case. So uh, smile when appropriate. So let me, so the first thing to make yourself more approachable, likable, and trustworthy based on your body language is the S is smile. What's the O? The O is, this is the interactive part. So here we go. The O is, just have to push down your button. I'd say being open, but that's yeah. more open. Who said that? Open. Yeah. Open. Oh, yeah. Hey, Betty. Yeah. Open is, yeah, you're right. Open is, uh, what I mean by open, um, and, and again, how many of you do this, for example, as a habit? Anybody do this as a habit? 
And this innocently could just mean I'm cold or I'm comfortable that way. But unfortunately, what do people pick it up as? They'll pick it up as, you know, standoffish or like, do I want to talk to that person? You're not, you know, should I say anything to them? You ever get in a disagreement with somebody and you start doing this and they start, it's just going to get worse. You know, we're not going to talk to anybody at that point. So I'm so conscious of how people perceive me now. Um, yeah, Jim just went ahead and did it. But anyway, <laughs> so, he, he's proved, he says, no, I don't, I disagree with that one. But anyway, um, but I, I'm so conscious that now I don't care how cold I am anymore. I keep my hands at my side because it does it, you know, and I think from Joel, he says people get defensive. It's, it's a defensive statement. So just be careful because, you know, you want people to be, you want to be more approachable. And I'll tell you, somebody's like this, I, I'll feel, you know, I'm an outgoing person, but I might not even talk to them. So you go from that point. The third thing to make yourself more approachable, likable, uh, trustworthy, the F is, Anybody want to take a guess? You can put it in the chat box if you'd rather not speak, but F is, yeah. Maybe friendly. Friendly, friendly is excellent. I like friend. That's even better than mine, but um, friendly is good. What else? Fun. Any, fun. It's good to be fun now and then too. It helps. Humor is, uh, what do they say in old, Patricia knows this one, but the, uh, the key to success in a speaker is, uh, What's the thing about uh, you need to be, uh, you need to have humor in your speech to be, you know, to be successful. I'm sort of getting that wrong, but anyway, um, what else? Not, those are good. Okay, let me, let me give it to you. First of all, the F, I'm gonna call it forward lean or focus. And so by way, so what I mean by forward lean, not leaning over like this, you know, at this point, but leaning towards the person you're dealing with. You know, when you're sitting, having your legs crossed towards the person you're doing, it's more of an informal type aspect of it, be very conscious of that. Even when you're on Zoom at this point too, leaning forward to make a point makes the difference in that case. So uh, focusing and, and paying attention to the person. So for example, on Zoom, you know, the ideal thing is to look right, look right into the camera lens, although I still like looking at the people in the thing, but looking right at the camera <laughs> lens is your ideal. And then when, the, how many of you ever been in a meeting when we get back to live meetings and we have like three or four people in the room and I'll tell you what, if there's three or four people in the room, you need to look at everyone in that room. And because everyone is, you ever been to a meeting where somebody didn't look at you, they looked at the other two people, not at you. And so how do you feel about that? Immediately, you just dislike, you know, the whole bit. It's a downer on that. I know for big presentations, when I have like a thousand people in the room, you know, um, and, and Patricia, chime in on this. She's the pro on all this stuff, so you can chime in. But, you know, you look at what? You look at one person in the back over here for, uh, you know, a little bit. And then you look at somebody here and they all think you're looking at them. So uh, make sure you do keep that eye contact. I mean, that, that focus on those people. So the T is what? And, and this does not apply necessarily to online, but in person. Make yourself more approachable, likable, trustworthy. By the way, this is American culture. This does vary by culture, but the, the T is- Touch, touch. Touch. Okay, let touch. me just say something about touch. Um, you gotta watch out who you touch because you could get in a lot of trouble on that. But, but they've actually shown, there was a restaurant called Bennigan's and they did a study and they've had waitresses who touch people here or here and they actually got like 20% higher tips. So touch is important. But just be very careful on who you touch. I always, I always hate these training programs where they say, okay, I want everybody to touch your neighbor. And I'm like, oh God, this is going to be lawsuits coming out of the yin yang. So I don't, I don't do that anymore. But touch is very important. But let me, anybody want to take a guess? Okay, let me give you this. This is a little trickier. But this is called territory. And territory means getting into somebody's space. So in American culture, the ideal distance to be away from somebody is about 14 inches to four feet. Has anybody ever known anybody when they're in your... They're talking to you and you're right in your face. And by the way, look at yourself too. Are you doing these? Get, stop it. And then you move backwards and what do they do? They don't get it. They just keep coming. They just, and, and all you picked up is what? Bad breath the whole time. You just want to get out of there. Um, so just be aware of the impression that you're making on that aspect. The, the E is, what's the E? To make yourself more approachable, likable, trustworthy, to get along better. The E is- I, some, Eye contact. Yeah, Janice got it. All right, Janice. Um, eye contact. And by the way, eye contact does not mean staring at anyone. Uh, there is a fine line between staring and stalking. You know, it's interesting when I do live presentations, sometimes you ever, and Patricia or Janice or some of you speakers know this, you, know, you ever have somebody just, and it's a small group and there's somebody just staring at you the whole time. And I keep wondering, it's like, is my zipper down or what? You know, I mean, what, what are they looking at? And it gets me nervous. And so um, just be wary uh, of that uh, thing. And by the way, in American culture, the ideal time to keep your eyes on anyone is what? 
You want to take a guess? They're close it, to you. <laughs> pardon? When they're too close to you? When their ideal time in American culture is about... I, I would guess five seconds. Yeah, Janice got it. It's about three to five seconds, but don't do this. Don't start going... Yeah, I got to get off now. You know, don't time it. Um, because when you're speaking to a group, what do you want to do? You want to like, if, you know, if I'm looking at Randall here and it's hard here, but keep your eyes on the person till you what? Till you finish the point, you know? And I, and I know like a lot of speakers, sometimes they'll go around and they'll, let me tell you about the six things and they're never really focusing on anybody. So be aware of that. But for individual stuff, three to five seconds, but don't time it and, you know, don't go crazy on that one. Uh, and the other thing about eye contact too, how can you tell, if people like you or they're getting along, let's say you're in a meeting, it's hard to do on, online, but let's say when you're in person, uh, let's say I have a group of six of you here. How can I tell by your eyes whether you're agreeing with me or buying into me or liking me just by your eyes? What's something I can look for? And what's one thing I look in their eyes? Yeah, Joel looks like he wants to say something. No. Their eyes are open. <laughs> Their eyes are open, yeah. Looks like they want to see something. Yeah. What else? <clears throat> your eyes tell you if you're frowning or smiling. Smiling. Yeah, your eyes can tell you if you're frowning or smiling. That's a good one. The eyes you, are... Your eyes if you're wide-eyed. Yeah, who said wide-eyed? Let me, let me tell you what I mean by... Yeah, let me... Uh, that was Steve. Yeah, wide-eyed... Um, what I mean by wide-eyes is the pupils tend to dilate. So let's say I'm talking to Steve over here. And you can't do this. This is an in-person thing, but Steve, and I sit starting to tell him something and his eyes start getting big. He's, I mean, his pupils start getting bigger. That that's a tendency to say, okay, it's one thing to look at that may say that he likes me or trusts me or agrees with me on that stuff. Now I was doing some work for the FBI a while ago and somebody raised his hand in the back and he said, Arnold, I don't mean to be rude. And you know, when that's coming, you're going to get hit in the head, but he says, I don't mean to be rude, but that's not always true. And I said, well, what do you mean? It's not true. And he says, well, they could also be on drugs. So you think somebody likes you, they could possibly be on drugs. They, you know, they're spun out. And so it's just a thing you may wanna take a look at at that point. So eye contact is one on there too. And then the last thing to make yourself more approachable, likable and trustworthy, uh, the N is- Nice. Nice is good, you gotta be nice sometimes. Anybody wanna take another guess? What do you do to show you're paying attention? Yeah, there he goes. Patricia's doing it. Not, not oh. nodding off now. Not nodding off. Um, you know, I, it's funny because I, I watch a lot of people speak sometimes, and they're yawning when they're speaking, and I'm thinking, man, they're bored by themselves. I don't, I don't get it. You know, so you got to watch out. You do that, and so, um, and by the way, when you're on the phone too, a lot of us just do online phone things now too. And let me hear. I, I need everybody to unmute for a second. I want to hear how you um, nod on the phone. So let me hear, let's say you're just talking to me. Let's hear your nods on the phone. Let me hear everybody. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. okay, I'm not sure I'm convinced, but anyway, um, <laughs> you, you, you got to watch how that comes across because it's interesting. My wife, uh, she, she's like really busy all the time. And uh, every time I call her, I'll say how things going. And she'll go, <laughs> which literally means, look, I have better things to do than listen to you. So, you know, it just gives an impression one way or the other. And you really got you to gotta watch out. Uh, for that aspect of it. So here's the reason I gave this to you. Um, when we're talking about getting along with other people, you need to create the positive image uh, and you need to be aware of the messages, your body language and your tone and everything is giving out. So I wanted to give you a little acronym how, how to soften your SOT, <laughs> smile, open, forward, territory, eye contact and nod. Uh, because if you don't do those things, you're not as approachable. You know, I'm, you know, if you're in my face, I'm not going to talk to you. You know, if you, you ever had somebody with somebody says, are there any questions? And they look so grumpy, you'd never forget it. I'm not asking or something like that. And, and then uh, people focus on you and not the message you're going to get across. So if you're in my face, I'm not focusing on you at all too. And, and online, this is really tough because you got to be, uh, you know, when one of the things on E I gave is eye contact, uh, but people are more convinced by your what? Your energy, enthusiasm, and conviction than anything else you do. It's sort of like those politicians are all convicted, not convicted, who um, for politicians who have <laughs> conviction, sort of a slip of the tongue here, who have conviction, they, you know, you follow them and you don't know why, but anyway, you move from there. So, so that's what I wanna do. Now, part of this going forward, so we've talked about the body language, but words also make a difference. Words can hurt. Um, you know, the old saying, um, what's the old saying? Um, Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt you. Well, they do. And I always say to clients of mine, be sure you taste your words before you spit them out. 
Has anybody ever said anything they regretted and nobody's talking to them anymore? Anybody ever done that before? Yeah, and so um, just be very careful. So let me give you some words just to be careful of because they create tension in people and not getting along. Um, what was the number one word, by the way, that was in USA Today a while ago, they said the number one word, and it was a Marist poll. 47% of Americans said they hated this word more than any other word. Anybody want to take a guess what that was? Take a guess, wild guess. No. No, it was probably a big one. Yeah, anybody else? Okay, the word was whatever, whatever. Um, you know, because when you talk about whatever, it's like, um, you know, whatever. It, it's just a dismissive term. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. One of the things I do is I coach people who have bad behavior. Well, I coach people with, I'll say that with bad behavior and they're working with their employees and I'll say, okay, I'll get them together in a mediation and I'll say, are you going to follow this guideline? And the guy I was working with a while ago said, well, whatever. And I said, well, whatever isn't really a good answer. So um, be careful of that one. Other words to watch out for is the word no problem. Oh, it's Patricia. Sorry, you had a question. Oh, I was going to say, well, if it's words we hate, it's right. like, like this, like it's, I hear people sitting behind me on planes, but I, my headset doesn't block them out. Like is in every sentence. Like in every sentence. Yeah, that's a good one there, right there too. And by the way, if you have any, uh, like Patricia, if you've just raised your hand, if you have something that you want to add, because again, this is about you, not just about me. And there's, there's a lot of experts in this room. So um, just feel free to bring that up. A uh, couple other words. I just want to give you real quickly here. No problem. Um, you know, people find here's it's I've done some work with Ritz Carlton and Hyatt and some of these other places. And when you go to a Ritz Carlton hotel, for example, and you say thank you for something, the desk receptionist, um, they say my pleasure, or they'll say something else but and they get fined by the way that's in part of their training never say the word no problem because when you say the word no problem. That means a lot of people in their mind think, well, was there a problem, you know, with that? So, um, and by the way, this has an age difference to it too. They're, they found that people born before 1980, this really is a really bugs them. But people born after 1980, it's not such a big deal. So, um, but a lot of these places I work with, they just take this out of their vocabulary totally because, you know, what people are going to think. So instead of saying no problem. Thank you. It was a pleasure, you know, something to that extent. So you may want to remember that. A few other words to stay away from. Uh, it is what it is. Has anybody ever had somebody tell you that? It is what it is. That means like, okay, forget it. We're not going to do anything. Just forget it. Uh, I love it. This one. It's not personal. How many of you have had somebody say it's not personal? Well, you know what? They're, they're going to kill you over that. Okay. So, you know, like Brian, it's not personal. All right. Moving on. Uh, the other word and versus but. You know, so it says like, Jim, you know, Jim, you did a great job, but, and as soon as I put, but I'm dismissing everything in there. So Jim, you did a great job. And here's some few other things you can do. Uh, I would also watch out for sarcasm. Uh, is anybody here? So just be honest with me. Anybody here sarcastic just by a show of hands? Anybody? Just two of you, three of us. Some of you got double hands up. <laughs> okay. In that case, I'm taking Craig off right now. Let me see. Uh, anyway, but, um, and, and when I say sarcastic, I'm a little sarcastic too. But how many of you ever been sarcastic to somebody who didn't get it and then they just never talk to you again? Anybody had that happen? So um, just be honest, uh, be very careful when you're that. And it's interesting too, um, big words, um, watch out. I know we're trying to impress people. Um, so take this out of your vocabulary because once I don't understand something, I don't listen to you anymore. So for example, my wife was talking to me the other day and she said, that's very pugilistic. That's very pugilistic. She kept going on to this word pugilistic. And I, after about 20 minutes, I said, you know what, Nancy, I've not heard one word you said, which is not a good thing to say to your wife, by the way. But she said, I've not heard one word you said. She said, well, why haven't you heard what I said? I said, well, what the heck is pugilistic mean? And she looked at me like I was an idiot. And she says, pugilistic means warlike. And I said, well, why don't you just say warlike? So, you know, keep it simple. And, and so people get you that. Um, by the way, one other thing too here is what's three words you should, three things these days that are very tricky, you should stay away from. Three words, three, th three things in your language when you're talking to somebody you don't really know. Yeah, let me get uh, Betty. One of them is why. When you ask why, it's a very confrontive word. Why is, that's a good one there too. So uh, that, that'll do it. Um, what else? Three keys. Okay, here's one. Um, the three things I would really watch out for these days because you're getting a lot of trouble, sex, politics, and religion. Um, just stay away from that. Actually, my uh, uh, a friend and uh, 
colleague, uh, Patricia knows him, Janice knows him, uh, Ron Culberson, um, you know, he, he always like what he says. Okay, so, you know, everybody gets, goes crazy with when we talk about um, politics. So we're just gonna talk about sex and religion today. So that's his, his motto, but anyway, we'll, meet, we'll move from there. Um, and, and so those are a few things. By the way, anything else you wanna add? I know this is just a short time. I wanted to give you some, Janice has a few other things, yeah. So I coached the fifth grade at my local elementary school on their speaking skills for nine weeks every year. And a lot of kids will say, and yeah. And yeah or, okay. Well, yeah, that's this new thing entering the vernacular. And I'm like, that's not a, that's not a sentence. And yeah, is not a sentence. So th that one's coming up. Okay, that's it. Anybody else have any that you wanna make sure we all know? Any words that just bug you and stuff that just create tension and people don't get along? Okay. Well, I have oh, yeah. uh, Rich on the call, who I didn't introduce before, is a grammarian. And uh -huh. so when people, even on the news, say me and George and using the um, using grammar incorrectly, that's a real that really gets rich. Speaking mm -hmm. for you, Rich. <laughs> and me, so. too. Yeah. By the way, how many of you use Grammarly? Anybody use Grammarly when they when you write stuff? That's like the best thing that came out. And I'll, I'll tell you, because uh, people think you're an idiot when you every time I write a letter, it lies like 97 mistakes before I fix it. And um, it, it, I had one client one time, I, I actually called me back and he said, uh, you know, you're this expert on communication and you can't even spell things right. And it was like I had to talk my way out of that one before I lost that job. But anyway, um, it, it does make an effect on you. So be very careful. Okay, so moving on, um, let me just finish this with, with uh, and then I'll just, we'll open some more questions if you have them, but how do we get everyone singing our praises so that everybody likes us, trusts us, wants to get, and gets, helps us just get along? And a few of these things right here, um, and I don't mean to be touchy-feely about all this stuff, but the first one is attitude. Um, and everything begins and ends with your attitude when you really boil it down to it. Um, you know, people keep talking about what is a glass half full or is it half empty? And I'm just grateful to have a glass to tell you the truth. So it's just how you look at things in that case. And it's interesting too, when we talk about attitude, um, you know, Hyatt Hotel, I did some work with them years ago. I don't know if they still do this, but when you went in for an interview at a Hyatt Hotel and you did not smile at least five times in a five minute interview, guess what your odds of getting a job were? you just, you would not get a job at that point. So it's, it's, you know, the old thing on attitude, it's not the situations that happens, it's how you look at them when you really deal with it. So let me give you something you can do to keep your attitude adjusted at all times when you're feeling down, when things are going bad. Uh, one of the exercises I did, and I had a client a long time ago, Dulles and National Airport in Washington, DC, and we did a year long program to help them get along better. And one of the things we did was called the flip side exercise. Anybody heard of that one before, a flip side exercise? Flip side exercise is where you look at the best thing no matter what. So we gave everybody at National and Dulles Airport, anybody from the guys driving the trucks to the managers, they gave them a little black book. And when something went wrong, you had to do what? You had to write the flip side of it. So somebody yelled at me, what's the flip side? No, what's the flip side? And so after a while, you start seeing the good thing. So let me test you on that. So if you hated your job, what's the flip side of hating your job? Anybody? At least you what? Getting the paycheck. I got a paycheck. I got a job, you know, so that you should be in good shape. Or you put a dent in your new car. What's the flip side of that? Now I can relax. Now I can relax. I don't have to worry about getting more dents. <laughs> Believe me, you look at <laughs> my car, I don't get the dents taken out because yes. I'll always get another. <laughs> so that's how Patricia stays calm. There you go. Just I don't have to relax on that. Uh, you know, a, a good one is this. Um, everybody's familiar with Christopher Reeves, who was Superman. Um, and a number, this was years and years ago, I was at a conference where he was one of the speakers and I was doing something speaking there too. But I sat through his conference and talking about attitude, he really made, he, I still remember this like 15 years ago or something, he would sit there because he can't move and he would go like this and he would look at certain people. I, I would change my place with any one of you for any of your so-called problems. And it was like, what problem do I have? You know, you could just see it there. So, you know, some of these people make a big impact on you too. And it, it takes a good look, but here's the other thing I would say about attitude. One thing that you can always do uh, every time something goes wrong, I always ask myself this question. What am I grateful for at the moment? Does anybody do that? What am I grateful for at this moment? So, um, and, and it's, it's, it's also, sometimes you get in this funk where you start going like, it used to be like Patricia before this COVID thing, I was traveling like crazy and it would like be, oh God, I got to go on another trip. <laughs> as soon as you say that, that's what happens. You start coming what? 
you start yeah. coming like, oh, I got to go on another present day. You know, it, it starts your attitude on a negative point already. Or has anybody ever had a call from somebody and you're thinking, oh God, here comes that pest again. <laughs> and so your tone and your voice is going to be, what's your tone going to be on the phone? It's going to, they're going to hate you. So um, just watch out how you do that. Uh, the second thing, so attitude's the first to, to get people singing your praises. And remember the two things there, flip side and what you're grateful for right now. Second thing is appreciation. And by the way, when you show appreciation, what happens? You feel what? The people. Lifted. You feel lifted. You feel actually good. You know, the hormone oxycotton, not oxycotton, um, oxytocin, <laughs> sort of so oxycotton will also, yeah. oxycotton will also make you feel good. But anyway, um, <laughs> oxy, forget that. Take that out of this uh, thing here. <coughs> you get the oxytocin comes in and you feel better. And just to give you an example of this too, um, Southwest Airlines, uh, for example, they have a five to one ratio where you need to, you need to be show, show appreciation at least five times before you show a negative reaction. Now it's not run a row, like you're good, you're great, you're terrible. Now you suck, you know, you don't do that, but it's, they want you to show more appreciation uh, in that case. So here's something you can actually do. Um, what I do with my clients who are not showing enough appreciation or you're afraid to do it. Um, I do the 21 day rule or the 60. Now there's another quote from England that says you do something 60, you know how you, how to make a habit, you do something 21 days in a row. And, but there's somebody else who says you do it 66 days in a row, which I don't like because I don't want to wait that long to make a habit. But I don't know, I, there's too many people have studies out there. But the thing I would recommend on this one is um, I have my clients say, okay, you got to say something nice to somebody every day for 21 days in a row. And guess what happens after it becomes a habit. And there's some really good people out there. And you probably know some of them who start, who do this. Anytime they see something, they are very appreciative and they're, they're grateful. Um, and what's the old saying, appreciate to be appreciated. Um, and it doesn't come across. And by the way, when you say you like somebody or appreciate somebody, they're, they're on a high for the next three weeks, you know, so they're, they're in great spirits because of that. And you did that part of it. So make sure you do that. And by the way, for those of you who have jobs or meet or work, uh, one of the, I had a law firm I was doing a retreat for recently, and I had the leader say, okay, I want you to give, uh, say one thing you appreciate about every person in this room. And then I had every person in the room do that. And they looked at me like I was from outer space. You got to be kidding. You know, like who's, they hated doing it, but once they finished it, they said, can we do it again? And I said, no, because we already did it, but they, you know, you want to, um, you know, keep that in mind. It's something to do. Third thing, uh, to get everybody singing your praises, um, and get, get along is be reliable. Um, and, and responsive. I'll put those into the same category. Uh, do what you say you're going to do. Do it when you say you're going to do it. Do it right the first time. Get it done on time um, and be available. And by the way, when we talk about being reliable, I always remember this from the Kona Garbage Company in Hawaii. Anybody ever, if you're ever out there, they had this on their trucks. It says, we guarantee complete satisfaction or double your garbage back. So there you go, if you need something to keep in mind. Um, third thing, uh, I'm sorry, it's just the fourth thing. Fourth. This is my fourth. Okay. Yeah. Be, be, uh, I would call it be credible. Um, and that's trust. And the old saying about trust, it takes years to build and seconds to lose. And, um, and I would say for those of you who have employees, uh, do they express trust and confidence? I actually get on some calls sometimes to call employees and employees of my clients and see, you know, answer them questions and stuff like that. Uh, and by the way, trust, when you talk about it, um, you know, it's the actions you take. For example, one of my clients, um, was we, we, a lot of times Patricia knows this and Jams, you know, you go on retreats and they want you to play golf. I mean, at least they say, can you play golf? I can't even play golf, but I play with them anyway. Uh, I play golf with them the day before. And I went out with the CEO of the company. I went out with one of their top vendors uh, and another player. And it's interesting because talking about trust, it's the things that you do that makes a difference. So we're going along on the golf course and the vendor, for those who play golf, the vendor hits the ball and he doesn't like where it stands. So he tells all of us, he says, do you mind if I move the ball? And I'm, I'm just like the hired help there, so I don't say anything. So I said, fine, and, and he moves the ball, which is really strange in golf to do that. Now in the third hole, he hits it, he doesn't like it. And he says, well, I'm just gonna move this to another place. He just says he's gonna move it, and he moves it again. The fifth hole, he hits it and he hits, he actually moves it right up to the hole. And about the seventh hole, the CEO of the company comes over to me and he says, hey, Arnold, could you come over here for a minute? Because I want to ask you a question, and I, and I have no clue what he's asking me. He says, "Do you?" And he, you know what he said? He said the vendor's name was Jim. He said, "Do you trust Jim?" 
And I'm thinking, okay, why is he asking that? We're playing golf. And I said, what do you mean trust Jim? And he says, well, he keeps moving that ball all the time. Do you think he's cheating us on our sales and our prices and our vendor stuff? And you know how two and two, you know, that people put things together. So uh, it, it's, it's all about your integrity and how you came across. And I don't know if you saw this in the paper the other day about the 11 year old boy who faked his kidnapping talking about integrity. Anybody see that one? It said uh, an 11 year old boy, I have to read this 11 year old boy faked his kidnapping Friday to avoid homing, bringing home a bad report card. He said a man with a pistol snatched him from school. The boy said the man forced him to a car and threatened to kill him. He escaped by jumping out of the car, but wasn't able to grab his book bag, which contained his report card. He ran to his grandparents and hours later and confessed to lying. So again, you know, it, it just sort of falls into place, but integrity is a part there and trust. And then the last two last things, uh, the next one is appearance. The old saying, don't judge a book by its cover. What does everybody do? They unfortunately judge a book by its cover. Um, and, and that includes a lot of things. That includes the soften we talked about. But what do we say? People make up their minds about you so quick. And I always like to say this too, you're always being judged. Um, you know, people are making up your minds instantly in that state. So as we said, perception is reality, which is not true, but my perception is what is your reality. So think about the group you're going to and all that stuff. And um, and by the way, I'll just say one example of this too. I was out in um, California one time working with Microsoft and I came in a suit and tie and I was about to walk in and the meeting planner pulled me by the collar and said, you can't go and looking like that. I said, what do you, what do you mean? She says, look at your audience. And they were all in t-shirts and shorts and jeans. And she says, they'll just think, oh God, another boring tie. I'll be in Patricia's book, another boring tie, you know, type of thing. So helping the boring speaker, but anyway, moving on. And so, the, and the last thing I want to make here is um, empathy. And this is really important in getting along with others. And I, I think it's the number one thing. And if you look at um, some of the ratings, uh, who was the, um, I forget, it's gold, did anyone talk about gold? Um, what's the one where people can rate their employees? Gold star, gold. Um, anybody know what I'm talking about? Where you can find out about your uh, glass, company? Glass, glass door. door. Glass door. Yeah, thanks, Janice. I have to have Janice with me all the time because she puts in the words for me. But, um, but glass door. And the, the person who got the highest marks as a, a leader was the president of Bain Capital because he, he rated the highest thing was empathy, 99, 100%. Empathy, empathy, empathy came out. Uh, and he said, that's the key to getting along. And when we talk about empathy, uh, it's taking the perspective of the other person on your uh, aspect of it. And we've all heard that term, walk a mile in my shoes. Uh, however, I'd go a little step further. Before you walk a mile in my shoes, you need to take off yours first. And, and, and I don't want to get political here because I learned not to do that. But, and so, but let me just give you an example of this. Uh, how many of you remember that Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick was uh, with this? Colin Ka he was with San Francisco, wasn't he? I think, yeah. yeah. And, and remember when he was, um, and I'm not making judgments one way or the other because anytime I say political something, they go crazy. But um, he was, he was, remember how he was on a, a bending on a knee type of thing, taking a knee on the field. And what do people immediately do? They, they either said, oh, that's terrible, or they liked it. It was terrible, or they liked it. But what people didn't do, they said, they didn't ask the question, well, why is he doing that in the first place? You know, you need to delve a little deeper in some of these things too. And by the way, do not do fake empathy. And what I mean by fake empathy, I had a woman in one of my sessions one time who during a break, she says, you know, I don't, I, I'm not, I, I know I'm not participating. I'm tired. Um, I was up all night. I had this really, and, and you know what she said to me? She said, I'm tired because I had a really bad pregnancy. And guess what I said to her? I said, oh, I can understand. And she looked at me and she says, you do not understand. So I, I, you know, you don't have to go to a class to get this figured out. So I, I do that uh, aspect of it uh, in there, in that case. So uh, again, um, you know, put yourself in their, their place and, and just listen to them in that case. So the five, so again, I wanted to give you those six key ingredients to make that work. And I'm going to end on this, but I'll still stick around if you have questions and stuff like this, because uh, I like to end on two quotes. And I always like this one by Maya Angela. We talk about getting along. This is like, the here's the crux of getting along. And she did a quote like this. And I, I think every speaker has probably used this in their speeches at one time or another, but she said, but it's so good. I keep it in my pocket. She says, people forget what you said. They'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And when you can do that, you're ahead of the game. It's sort of like that old saying, be interested, not just interesting. Uh, which makes a difference, which is the key to popularity. And I'll end with one more quote there too, is because 
the people that get along the best, um, I tend to say they're nurturers. And I don't mean to be, again, touchy-feely about this stuff, but we have a number of constituencies. You all have people you deal with. You have your coworkers, your employees, your customers, bosses, family and friends too. And your family and friends are just as important because if you're not getting along with them, it affects everything else. And Mahatma Gandhi said this. He said, everyone is like a plant in the garden. And if you don't water and feed them, they're not going to grow. And I'll leave you with this. He said, keep your thoughts positive because your thoughts become your words. Keep your words positive because your words become your actions. Keep your actions positive because your actions become your habits. Guard your habits and keep them positive because your habits become your values. Keep your values positive because your values become your destiny. And he ended up by saying that every day is a new beginning and you must always remember that the nurtured seed always produces the abundant harvest. So uh, again, I want to thank you for having me and I hope you have an abundant harvest and I'll stick around. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank you, Arnold. Thanks. That was, that, I, I can't believe the time went so fast. I was like taking notes and um, it's, you know, just, I loved it. Uh, well, thank you, let's, appreciate let's it. Let's open it up for a few questions. Patricia, I see your hand up. Oh yeah, well, that was so much fun, very useful, wonderful. And I believe the quote you were looking for, Bill Gove, and this was talking to speakers, do you have to be funny in your speeches? And he said, only if you want to get paid. Only if you want to get paid. So <laughs> I don't know that that is 100% true because we have some great deep analytical content experts. And I remember one of my earlier speech coaches always used to say, whether it's a boardroom or an auditorium, you want piece of the pie eye contact. Mm -hmm. You look at the audience or your audience around a table for a thought, an idea, or a phrase, which mm -hmm. would probably come out at your three to five seconds. And then Jerry Seinfeld said, <laughs> right. If you're a big auditorium, come out and play to the cheap seats first, mm -hmm. because once they know that you know they're there, they'll stay with you when you're interacting with the people it's easier to see. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting when she mentions the cheap seats too, it's, um, I had the opportunity one time, I, I look at the meeting planners international and they had like, who, did the, who was one of their top speakers they like to hire. This was years ago, but it was Bill Clinton. And they said they liked him because not just the speech, what you do. And, and you know, when you talk about getting along, it's not just your presentation. I mean, I've actually seen people who are not that good even at presentations, but they were so authentic. They came across so well. I gave them like a, you know, A plus on their presentation. And then I see some other people, they come across, well, I know it all, you're all idiots, you know, that type of thing. And it's like, even though they're good at the techniques, um, you know, it's still something. So it's, it's how you came up. But with the Bill Clinton, they said they liked when he would go into a room, he would never talk to like the quote unquote cool people. He talked to the wait staff, the waiters. He'd go around and meet everybody at the, uh, what do you call it? At the trade show dock. And then he'd talk to like the big, the quote unquote big people. And, and it's really impressive. And, and that some of these things stick in your mind that the things that you want to um, replicate. So, yeah. Joel, you had a question? No. And Betty? No, and Betty? I'm good. Um, in terms of the word appreciation, uh, what I do um, on the phone with people, be it USAA or anybody or pharmacy or whatever, I always say thank you and thank you for working because they're putting themselves yeah. out there. And if I'm in person in the pharmacy or whatever, uh, I always say thanks for working. Even the delivery people, I try to go to the door and catch them and say thank you. Um, I think it's really important. Yeah, and I like what Betty said too, because, but, and I always say too, the, the thing I, I add to make sure of that, because, um, is make sure you're just uh, genuine and authentic. And, and, and it sounds, you know, your voice is very authentic too. So, I mean, it comes across well. Yeah, on that same line, I, I go to a grocery store um, regularly. And I've just, I always ask the baggers and the cash register people, you know, who their names are. And I always crack a joke, but when I come back the next time, I always call them out. Hey, thanks, Jim. I really appreciate you bagging the groceries for me. You know, I, yeah, I don't think they get much of that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, it's a nice thing. Yeah. Alan. I'll tell you what, I, what I do <clears throat> to show appreciation, especially when I'm on the phone is uh, when I'm 
ending the conversation, I always tell the person that was helping me that um, they should go to their boss and tell them that I told the boss that they should get a raise. And they <laughs> always appreciate that. that. Yeah. You know, one other thing I'll mention about appreciation too, and this goes back to Janice as the burnout expert. So you can add on to this if you want, but uh, it was interesting. One of the things I do as a volunteer, I'm a volunteer ski patroller. I don't know if anybody skis, but anything but that, but I was doing that forever. And then I, and you know how sometimes they move you up to be the head of the ski patrol. Oh God. And, and you had like 90 people you had to deal with. And I have this other business going, but, but I was getting burned out and really burned out about doing it. And then talking about appreciation one day, I was skiing down the hill and there was a woman who had broken her leg, uh, broken her pelvis and leg and the whole nine mm -hmm. yards. And I was first on the scene and we, I did all sorts of um, maneuvering and we called a helicopter and we got everything, but she wrote me like this three page letter thanking me so much and it just changed my whole attitude around. So, you know, you can, you can actually change people around. And, and again, I'm taking Janice's thing here on the burnout, but, and she may want to add to this too, but you know, talking about burnout, it's just that simple letter of appreciation to me changed the way I looked at the whole thing and stayed on instead of like, I don't want to do this anymore type of thing. Derek yeah. Arden. Quick statistic from Europe. Um, in London, touching is a no zone. Be very careful if you touch people when you're in London. Whoa. But in Italy, <laughs> in Rome, the statistic was that people touch each other about 100 times. So don't be fooled if you fly into Rome or you fly into London. So uh, touching is very much a, uh, depending where, where you are, issue. Yeah. yeah, and it's interesting when you mentioned touching too, because I my local National Speakers Association group in Washington, Capital Speakers Association, everybody hugs everybody. It was just, it's part of our culture to hug everybody. And and if you don't hug somebody when they're coming in, they think, oh, why did you hug him and not me? You know, And it goes <laughs> on this, it just gets worse. <laughs> it's like, and, and, and we actually had somebody who wrote a letter to the president one time. She said, why'd you hug Arnie and not me? And it's like, and it was just it like, oh boy. So, yeah. Uh, Bert? Yeah, I just want to mention, just reminded me to everybody, uh, be sure to tip your postman this year. They've been through holy hell. Times and, like uh, this, how can they okay? Just, just, just a suggestion. They're, they're the people who serve us all the time, yeah. every day. I know my postman very well, and I su assume you do too. Uh, just do that as a final thing for Christmas. So I have a question about that. When yeah. I was, I have a question about that. When I was a little girl, my grandmother always gave them a bottle of whiskey. So <laughs> I don't think that's what I want to do. But I'm curious, Bert, what do you suggest? What kinds of gifts do you suggest? Well, I just give them money. Oh, you we do? Give a, we, we give them a Christmas card with money in it. Oh, wow. That's nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's the most yeah. convertible for, form of gift because I don't know him well enough to know what kind of whiskey he drinks, you know, right. but uh, yeah. Anyway, some years but, ago, but I think money is universal. Some years I, ago, I, some years I ago, backfired that Bert, that uh, backfired the uh, delivery person said it's illegal to tip federal employees. Yeah. Yes. That's yeah. right. They, they cannot I do it. I tried to tip postman, and they said, "I appreciate it, but we are not allowed to take it." Oh, See, it is. I, I do. It's against federal law. Here. You are, you you got a corrupt postman. What can I <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's against I got to go, but Arnie, them. it was wonderful. Oh, well, thank then, you, Patricia. Yeah. Thanks. Then, Absolutely then, loved it. Now. Who is our speaker next week, Mr. President, before I leave for my next meeting? Oh, yes. Okay. So it is at 8.59. So it's, uh, next week we've got, um, I think, new kids are going to be talking. So we'll oh, be making good. the for the new kids. So that's going to be real special. And then uh, following that, we've got some special things happening for Christmas, which we'll announce next week. So you want to be there. And, um, and then we're kind of wrapping up the year. So we're looking at speakers for the first quarter of next year. So if you guys have some suggestions, I know Patricia's shared many of hers, and but we're certainly um, looking at uh, who we want to bring in. And so we can have year number two start off with a bang. So um, appreciate it. And there's my cat. <laughs> you Is that a Siberian, by the way? Siberian cat? She's like, like a, a, carpet. a Maine Coon, you know. Maine Coon, okay, yeah. yeah. Beautiful cat. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah. All right, and uh, we'll, Arnold, again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Let's thank you. Let's go the meeting. It's nine o'clock and um, uh, fantastic time today. So thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. We'll have thank this morning. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invite. Just excellent. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
So I want to point out that Hanukkah starts tomorrow night. So happy Hanukkah to everybody who's celebrating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Happy Hanukkah. Okay, thank you. Happy Hanukkah thank to everyone you. who's not celebrating. Let's <laughs> yeah. take every single celebration thank we you. possibly can. It's yeah. all part of Arno's message to make us feel good right. and yeah. appreciate it <laughs> and appreciate yeah. each other. Good point. Yeah. Like you know, I was the synagogue secretary for many years for the the Jewish services at NSA. <laughs> oh, you were? I never knew yeah. that. Yeah. And you live and learn. I was a greeter. And I made it when they let me pass around the wine. <laughs> 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 <Okay>. <laughs>